uh, everything I'm going to say is, is either published or at least available on the net. So I'm, what I'm going to give you is a sketch sort of a, of a new method. Uh, but if you want details, either, either ask me or, or, or you can find them here. So uh, what I want to introduce is, uh, to you is a, is a new method uh, that's kind of a hybrid between two, two old methods. Uh, and it's the thesis work of Caspar Steinman. So, so Caspar Steinman will defend this, this thesis in a, in a couple of weeks. Um, and this is in collaboration with Dmitry Fedorov uh, in Japan. Okay, so this, this new method really starts with, the, uh, with another method called the fragment molecular orbital method. Uh, second order. So a lot of you probably know about it. Uh, so I'll just sketch it very briefly because I need to explain the differences between the FMO method and the, and the, EFO method, the EFMO method. So there's a, there's a lot of these fragmentation methods out there, and Arnfin also worked on the fragmentation method, and they all take, um, they all start with this uh, expansion uh, here truncated to second order of, of the energy, right? So you break things up into fragments, you calculate their energy, and then you calculate some of the uh, pairs also. Okay, but this equation is a little bit misleading in the sense that in all these calculations, you have the field of the of the rest of the fragments uh, in there. So these are just explicit uh, non-classical uh, pair calculations. Uh, so the idea is uh, you have monomers, and so in this case, I just picked a water cluster, but it's completely general. Um, and so you pick a water and you do the SDF, but like I said, uh, this is done in the Coulomb field of the other monomers. And then different fragments, use, some use point charges, some use uh, the actual density, some use the frozen density, there's a million different variations. Uh, but the idea basically is that the polarization uh, of one fragment with another uh, goes much further than second order. Right? This, so this is, since this is iterated to self-consistency, the classical polarization is, is still n order, no matter whether it's called FMO 2 or 3 or 4 or whatever. Uh, so this has to be done uh, again and again for each monomer. And then you do uh, select dimer calculations. Uh, and this is to get the non-Coulomb effects. Uh, so charge transfer and exchange repulsion and all the other things we heard about. Uh, so you actually do a, a, a quantum calculation. It's still here, in this case of the water dimer, and it's still done in the field of the other fragments. Uh, but now it's not iterated to self-consistency. <coughs> okay. So uh, the idea is that this is really a high order. This pol so what you're asking here, what, is, what effect does the polarization have on short-range interactions. Uh, and experience has basically shown that you don't need to, uh, to iterate that. And that's good because the dimer calculations are the, the expensive ones, right? Because now the, the fragment is, is bigger. And as we all know, quantum mechanics doesn't scale linearly. Uh, then to speed things up, um, if this dimer pair is not if the electron density of the two monomers that make the dimer do not overlap, uh, then, you just, then you just do a Coulomb field. Uh, okay, and so that's ultimately what's, what speeds it up. Okay, it, but there's no, there's no multiples or anything like that. It's still, it's still densities. Uh, and this is, this is particular to, uh, to FMO, at least this, this particular implementation. Okay, and so that's, there's some expensive bits here. Uh, the dimer calculations are expensive. Um, so even, so what I mean by, by Coulomb energy is, is, is just the, the interactions. So you don't do an, an SCF for these long range uh, interactions, but there's still, you still use integrals, so they're still expensive. Uh, this is expensive, and the fact that you have to do this over and over again is also a little expensive. Okay, so, so the idea with the effective fragment molecular orbital method was to make this a little bit cheaper. Uh, and the reason we want to make it cheaper, as you see, is the fact that 
uh, while FMO is very fast for single point energies, uh, it's not fast enough to really to do extensive geometry optimization. <clears throat> and if you want to, as we do, if you want to look at reactions and enzymes, you have to optimize, and you have to optimize a lot. I'll show you an example of this. And unless you have very uh, large computer resources, it's, it's still not practically possible uh, to do an application where you look at enzyme catalysis with FMO, at least, in, at least with our computational resources. So we decided to, 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 to speed some of these things up. Uh, the idea is still the same, right? So you, you have fragments, and these would be exactly the same kind of fragments as an, as an FMO, and we, again, we truncate uh, at second order, uh, but we do things a little bit differently. Uh, so now we do the monomer. These calculations are done in the gas phase. Okay, so that's what the zero means. And so there's no, since it's done in the gas phase, there's no iteration uh, that you have to do on the monomer calculations. Uh, so these, these, these water molecules here are invisible. Uh, so in addition to getting the, the energy for this monomer, we then also get the multipoles and the dipole polarizabilities. Uh, so for those of you who are familiar with the effective fragment potential, we, we calculate an effective fragment potential, but just the classical part, the electrostatic part. And we save these. We're going we're gonna to use them later. Um, so that's this term. Uh, then I'm going to skip all the way over to this term. And that's, the, that's the polarization energy. Okay, so now we have induced, we have dipole polarizability tensors, and for all the electron pairs. So we do that in, in an LMO basis. And we now calculate the polarization energy to n order, to nth order. Okay, so even though, again, it's, we truncate here for dimer calculations, that, again, that's for the short range interactions. So the electrostatic polarization is done to n order. It's done purely classically. Okay, so it's very quick. Uh, then we do dimer calculations, <coughs> and so just like, well, almost like the FMO calculation, we now do some ab initial calculations for dimers. Uh, the difference, though, is that, again, this is not done in an electric field of anything else. This is done in the gas phase, right, because the polarization we've already, we've already done uh, as well as we could classically. So this is to... Take, this is to calculate exchange repulsion, charge transfer, and all these other things that are short range. And so we have a cutoff. We have some criterion that says this is close. We have another criterion that says this is far away. And if they're far away, we just calculate the electrostatic interaction energies using static multipoles. Remember, we've already done the polarization. Uh, and so here we use uh, multipoles up to quadrupoles on all the atoms. Okay, but each, again, each, each multipole is calculated specifically for each fragment. Okay, so this water geometry is a little bit different from this water geometry, and so it's calculated uh, separately. Okay, so anything with transferability of multipoles and rotation of multi, any that's gone, right, because it's calculated from scratch every time. Uh, so that was for Fock. Uh, so for MP2, uh, right now, we just say for long range that this is zero, but in fact, we're, that's very easy to correct for with, uh, with uh, dispersion, either taken from the effective fragment potential method, that's almost working. Or you can just use these D dispersion corrections that you use for DFT and just add that on top. So that's, that's basically a solved problem. So this is, it's not quite working completely the way we want, so I'm still showing this slide, but this is not really zero. Uh, for the, in, very soon this will be just a classical dispersion. Of course, we, we would still use, or at least technically, you still probably still want to do actual MP2 calculations here because at short range there are other things, the MP2 delivers other things than dispersion. And there's also overlap effects and things like that. <coughs> so the bottom line is you can, you can do this at the correlated level. So that's water, uh, or any solvent, anything that's not covalently bonded. But of course, 
uh, we're interested in, in proteins, and so you have to deal with the fragmentation problem. Uh, and so here we use uh, a frozen localized molecular orbital method. So the idea is, is quite simple. You, you find LMOs for the bond, so you would cut right here. Actually, technically, you cut, you cut right here. This is then frozen doing the SCF, and that keeps the electron density where it should be. Um, so that's similar to the way, for example, QSite does the, the QMMM covalent boundary. Uh, the main difference is that this is, this is calculated on the fly again, right? So if you want to cut here, we cut out a little piece like this, do an SCF calculation, extract the localized orbitals, and so forth. So there's nothing, again, there's no transferability issues or anything like that. It's completely general to things that are not proteins because it's calculated on the fly every time. So, for, so how, does this, how does this compare? So here's a, here's a small, very small protein. Uh, where, and now we look at the, the error in the total energy compared to a conventional MP2 calculation. Uh, or, yeah. So this is small enough that we can actually do an MP2 calculation on this. And so the bottom line here is this is the error in the total energy, and we're, well, we're, we're as good as FMO2, and we're a little bit faster. Uh, but this is not, so you can say that's, you know, you want to put several years of work into save, saving 100 minutes. Uh, no, that's, it's going to be, for the next application, it's going, to be, it's going to be much faster than that. But the bottom line is if you're interested in the energy of the whole system, this mimics a, con a conventional SCF calculation uh, with this, about the same accuracy, sometimes better, sometimes worse, than FMO2. So all the approximations we've made, and especially the approximation that the polarization of the entire system is done purely classical, right? that, that's a good approximation. Yeah, that's really where the error would, would come in. Okay, so, but what we really want to do with this, well, let me just back up to sort of make the, make the point of, of the title, right? So, in essence, this is, you can view this as a kind of a force field. It's a polarizable, multipole-based, transferable force field, okay? Because all the long-range interactions here are done classically. Uh, it's transferable because we do each, cal we, we calculate, we calculate the fragment properties, the multiples and polarizability tensors every time. That includes doing a geometry optimization. So every time we change the geometry, we recalculate everything from scratch. So it's a very, very expensive force field if, if force field timing is your metric, right? But it's, it's sort of the ultimate force field uh, in, in the sense that it's recalculated every time and multiples and polarizabilities are taken into account and all short-range interactions are done purely from scratch using quantum mechanics. Right, so there's no adjustable parameters here other than there's, of course, some parameters for screening and things like that. But it, it's really, in a sense, as, as close as you can get to an ab initio calculation, but with as much force field as, as you could put in there uh, uh, without introducing a lot of parameters. Right? But, of course, like I said, it, it's slow compared to... This is not something you're going to use for, for an MD simulation of a protein fold. Okay, but that's, not, but that's also not what we want to do with it. What we, what we, what I want to do with this is QMMM, so enzymatic reactions. Um, and so we're going to, it's QMMM in the sense that uh, we're going to have what we call an active region and then a frozen region. And so a frozen mean, that mean region means that the geometry out here is frozen. So again, this is a toy example of a water cluster, but imagine Let's say you wanted to optimize the geometry of this in the frozen field. Not f density is not frozen, but the geometry is frozen. And that might sound like a bad idea, but if you look at, at QMMM calculations uh, on enzyme reaction mechanisms, you always freeze most of the system when you, when you calculate the barrier. And the reason for that, well, almost all. There's, there are some exceptions, but the... the the most conventional QMMM calculations, you freeze most of the geometry anyway, 
And the reason you do that is that you don't want energy fluctuations of, let's say, a hydrogen bond on the surface rearranging. You don't want to, that energy change, you want to keep that out of the barrier, the barrier calculation. So basically, you freeze the geometry to get as much cancellation of error as possible. Okay, the only other alternative is to go over to, say, what Warshall is doing, where the QM description is so cheap that you can do extensive sampling, and all this little stuff on the surface cancels out. But if you want to do something like a, a correlated method for your quantum region, then the only way you're going to get numerical stability for your barrier is to, is to freeze a lot of the system. Okay, so that's what we're going to do here. Uh, and so if you freeze a lot, of a, system, a lot of the system, then these equations, really, well, the equations don't simplify, but the, the speed goes up tremendously, right? Because once you've done a quantum calculation on each monomer, you're, you're done with this region, right? If the geometry doesn't change, then the multiples are not going to change, and the energy is not going to change. So you don't have to redo these calculations when you change this geometry. You don't have to do any dimer calculations, even if they're very close to each other, because it's going to be constant. It's not going to contribute to the barrier which, which you're trying to compute. Okay? So, oops. so what you're looking at here then is if you want to optimize the geometry in the field of this using the EFMO method, you do six monomer calculations. Okay? But then any subsequent calculation where you optimize the geometry, right, the stuff that really takes time, you're just doing that on the monomer and maybe some dimer calculations here if this is, is really close to this such that the density overlaps. But the main point is that when you freeze a lot of the system in the EFMO method, then the cost is basically, to a very good approximation, the cost is basically just the cost of your active region. So it's QMMM in that sense, right? The main cost of your QMMM calculation is the, is the size of the QM region, right? The difference is that this is a polarizable multipole-based QMMM, right? So you still have multipoles sitting out here up to quadrupoles. You can also go to octopoles if you want. And this is completely polarizable. It's calculated at a particular level, so you can change the basis set. Right? And there are no adjustable parameters. If you go to another protein or another system, right, you do the calculation from scratch. Okay. And this is, this is very cheap compared to, to FMO or to any sort of traditional uh, linear scaling QM method. So it's so cheap, in fact, that you can, that you can really start doing um, a, a proper, I would say, a proper QMMM study. Okay, so there's a lot of information on this slide. Um, it's a proof of concept calculation, and we picked the same reaction that everyone else. So this, I think it's a law. If you do QMMM on enzymes, if, you don't, if the first system is not chorus made mutase, then you're not going to be taken seriously. So, and that's because this is, this is the one case where, you, where there's no boundary between the substrate, covalent boundary between the substrate and the, and the enzyme. Okay. In our case, we actually don't care, right, because we do the boundary on the fly. But, but anyway, this is why, this is, this is why we picked it. Um, it's also studied experimentally quite a bit, which is very nice. So again, just like a normal QMMM calculation on an enzyme, we do not do the entire system. We cut out a piece. Okay, so that's standard, even if you're using a, a force field. Right? Because once you get very far away from the action, right, the field is, the contribution is basically zero. So we chose a uh, radius here of 16 angstroms from, from the active side. Here you can see chorus mate. And everything in red here is, it's what's go is what is going to move during the geometry optimization. Uh, so we have chorus mate, we have the substrate that's going to undergo this intermolecular conversion, and then we have uh, some water molecules. So this, these structures come from molecular dynamic simulations and solvent. So when we cut out something, we also cut out solvent molecules. So there's some solvent molecules in the active site. 
and there are some uh, enzyme, there are some amino acid side chains that make contact uh, with, with the substrate, and they're also allowed to move. Okay? So it's a pretty big QM region, right? but what you have to remember is that this is not done by conventional QM. This is still done by the EFMO method. Right? So a lot of these interactions in here are done purely classically. Okay, so it's still quite fast. Uh, but you also have to remember that uh, just because something, that if, if something is sitting next to something that moves, right, then we occasionally do dimer calculations to treat the, the non-classical interactions like exchange repulsion and charge transfer. Okay, so there's, there's a little bit more calculation involved actually than it, than it looks, but again, at most it's, it's dimer calculations in the gas phase. And the whole thing is polarized. The whole thing is calculated. Multipoles are calculated from scratch, so there's no transferability issue or anything like that. Uh, and so in order to find or to estimate the barrier, again, we do a standard trick in QMMM. This, this is just simple adiabatic mapping. All right, so we pick 10 intermediate points where we, uh, let's see now. So this is one, so we lengthen this bond and we form this bond. So we force the reaction to go. These bond lengths, these two bond lengths are kept fixed, right? and everything else is minimized. That's the definition of adiabatic mapping. So we're doing a lot of geometry uh, optimizations. Right? We're doing, for each barrier, right, we do a geometry optimization here at this point, this point, this point, this point, this point. Okay? So it has to be fast if you want to do this. Uh, and with this particular setup, uh, using, I would say, a reasonable amount of CPU power, uh, we can get one of these paths in four days, four well clock time days. Right? And so that's reasonable for a project, to set something up on Monday and to start analyzing it Friday. Okay? And, of course, you can't just do this once. Uh, if you take different snapshots... Start, if you start with different snapshots along your MD, you'll get different barriers. Right? That's well known. That's other QMMM studies have shown that too. Right? So you have to do many of these, as many as you can afford, and then average. So the bold here, that's an average path. So every point here is, is averaged. Right? And so in this particular case, this uh, average barrier is an average of seven calculations. Right? So seven times four days. So it's, it's really important that this is fast, that you, so you can afford to do all these things. Um, and so, and I should, I mean, I think it's obvious, but I'll emphasize, every time we use a different snapshots, the whole thing is done from scratch again. Right? The multipoles are recalculated. Well, uh, everything, is, everything is redone. Okay, so how well do we do? Well, the average uh, barrier height is 18 kilocalories per mole, and the experimental value uh, is 13. So this is an enthalpy, so we haven't addressed the, the entropy issue here yet. So that's an error of 5 kilocalories per mole. And so, again, if you look at what's, what can you live with as a QM, or what can you expect as a QMMM uh, person, and that's reasonable. Uh, we took, we got inspired, or we, we followed the methodology of a similar study by Adrian Mulholland, and their error, uh, that was using DFT instead of MP2, and their error was three kilocalories per mole. So they underestimated the barrier by three, and we overestimated it by five. So, so pretty close. This is, but this is the first shot at, at all this. And I think the main difference actually comes from the, the fact that he allowed a much larger region to move. Um, I think a lot of these differences will go away if a larger region around the active site can change its geometry. Then it becomes less dependent on the starting geometry. But of course, then the, then the time also increases. Okay, but the takeaway message from this, from this talk, actually, and certainly from this slide, is that um, with, the, with the EFMO method, you can now look at enzyme catalysis without cutting, you're cutting corners, but you're cutting exactly the same corners as in a normal QMMM study. 
right? You, you don't use the whole protein. You freeze some of it, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, the difference is that there's, there's no adjustable parameters here. Uh, when it says 61 GD, that means 61 GD everywhere on the whole thing, right? And all the electrostatics are done, um, are, are converged. So it's, it's, and it's not a proof, I mean, it's a proof of concept in the fact, in the sense that it was the first thing we did, but it's not the usual proof of concept study that probably couldn't be replicated, uh, right, because it's too, it's too expensive. Okay, so it's working pretty well as a first shot, but there are some things uh, we would like to be able to do. Oh, I should say, I, uh, it, it says here, but I didn't explain. So onion, what we did here is we optimized with Hartree-Fock. And then we took this piece out and calculated it with MP2. Okay, so uh, so that's what the that's what the the, the onion means. Uh, we're pretty close to having a method working where we could actually optimize this with MP2. Right. So this is treated with MP2, and the rest is treated with Hartree Fox. So we also get correlation effects on the geometry. And the cost is, is basically, the additional cost of doing an MP2 calculation is basically negligible because most of the time here still comes from doing the dimer calculations. Uh, so MP2 would provide correlation for where the reaction is happening and a dispersion correction, uh, for this is the, the Grimmy one that we use, would handle the long range dispersion. And that's, that's almost done. Uh, what's on the drawing board is uh, an, an, now an interface with PCM, so that you put PCM around the entire thing. Uh, and so that PCM has already been implemented with the FMO method. So we know we can do PCM calculation on protein size systems. Right? It's just now a matter of implementing it with the EFMO method so that the field is done classically instead of, instead of quantum mechanics. So that's, uh, that's coming, but we haven't started working on that yet. Um, the, the main, so I, I love this method, right? But the main problem it, it has, it has a problem, and that is that if you make, if you want a lot of the geometry to move, right? So for example, a normal, the, the QMMM study by, by Mulholland et al. at this system, right? They're movable region was 16 angstroms, right? And then they went out to 25 angstroms with frozen geometry, right? So if we want this whole thing to move, right, then our method is still too slow. And the reason is that you're still doing too many dimer calculations. Uh, so if you want to be able to do that, you have to get rid of if not all, then most of the dimer calculations. And that means that you have to model the exchange repulsion and charge transfer, uh, and uh, not with quantum mechanical calculations, but with some other way. And so, of course, EFP has um, approximations to this that are general and that can be extracted from quantum calculations. And so one of the, one of the ways of doing this is to implement those equations. Another approach is to, to, is to develop something new. But again, the idea would be something where you take a property of the monomers that is calculated on the fly uh, and then cheaply giving you this, this last term that you're missing. So that the only cost, the only real cost, is the calculation of the monomers and the monomer multiples and the monomer polarizability tensors. And then it'll definitely be fast enough. Uh, to allow us to, to optimize something like this. So, but that's, that's still very much into the future. And uh, yeah, so to be completely honest, right, the main thing here now is that it, it's, if you have a reasonably small active region, it's fast enough, but the cost grows uh, quite rapidly as you increase that region. Uh, another thing that's, it's not a, as big a problem uh, because it can be scripted away. But uh, 
you have to fragment this. And so for proteins, that's not a problem because it's, you know what the chemistry is, right? But there might come a time where you have to fragment your, your reacting system. Uh, and so that's, it's a little bit hard to automate, right? Because you have to make some chemical choices about where you want to cut. But with a graphical user interface, it can be made much easier, right? And QMM, traditional QMM calculations are also quite tricky to set up. It's not black box. Just the fact that we don't have any adjustable parameters doesn't make our method black box, right? And the main problem is the fragmentation. That still has to make chemical sense. It's not a problem for the protein, but it's a problem if you want to fragment what's inside uh, the active site. But we have a GUI uh, and a, a program that sort of can be scripted where you can pretty easily define where you want to fragment. So, so I don't think it's a, it's a big problem, but it is, it is there. Okay, and uh, this was funded by an EU collaborative uh, project. So I thank the EU for giving us some money. And I thank you for your attention. And if you have questions now, I'd be happy to, to answer it. And if you have questions later, this talk and the slides are up on this website. Uh, just remember proteins and wave functions. Google that and you'll, you'll find the slides uh, and, some, and some other things. So, so thank you, and I'll be happy to, to answer any questions you have.